income individuals rise above poverty. So here is Chenny and Marcus. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us on a lovely Thursday afternoon. I'm Chenny. Hi, I'm Marcus. Uh, we're based here in Toronto, Canada, and in case you're wondering, it definitely is cold. So we're going to talk to you today about how we helped low-income folks living in our East End rise above poverty. But first, we just wanted to start off by quickly thanking Sustainable UX for giving us the opportunity to share our story. So about a year ago, Marcus and I were doing some digging on the current state of poverty in our country. And we were shocked by the stats that we found. Today, 12% of Canadians have to make hard decisions between necessities, like between purchasing healthy food or taking their kid to get a cavity removed. And on top of that, a quarter of Canadians are just a paycheck away from being in that same tough place. So really, in total, you're looking about a third of Canadians who either live in or are on the brink of poverty. So how does that really impact the rest of us? Like, why do we care? Well, for starters, just to support that 12% alone, we each contribute about $2,600 a year, or roughly $78 billion as a country every single year. So you can kind of just do some quick math and imagine what that number might look like if we were to support a third of Canadians and not just the 12%. And there's really a lot of like factors in play here. So if we look at it, generational poverty is huge, but also trends such as urbanization and the move to automation, you know, caused by artificial intelligence, um, the you know the impact that uh, the Internet of Things and all these other factors have. There's really, um, there's really, uh, uh, this is how it's been impacting folks. So we start to build on that. Um, we really started as designers, taking our design lens, really, how might we be able to mobilize kind of a learning and skills development process that will really account for both the destruction and the creation of jobs? So the situation people are in currently, but also situation they may be faced in in the future. So you're probably thinking, well, who are you to work on this? <laughs> so I'm Chenny. A um, little bit about me. I'm an avid multi-day hiker. I have a dog. In the day, I help corporations innovate by building service design and agile capabilities across teams. And at night, I bring the same frameworks and tools into my personal life and into my community. Hi, I'm Marcus. I'm a design leader leading design teams in large enterprises. I've worked in startups and in design firms. I'm passionate about teaching design thinking, creative problem solving to students in inner city, city communities here in Toronto. I'm a proud father and husband. And I really love to uh, really love to teach. So taking in our lived experiences and knowing what we know, Marcus and I thought, well, what if we took the skills that we use to today largely serve the top one percent and flipped it? So in other words, as designers, what would it look like if we served the bottom one percent instead? So after many, many cups of coffee, <laughs> we thought, well, what if we created a safe, hands-on learning environment for that bottom 1%? And what if we help people who are stuck in poverty actually develop the skills and confidence through personal growth that they needed in order to rise above it? So we started like we do, like we do with designers, is really developing empathy. You know, whether with community members, with the counselors and the support workers. And we came together. Um, we were strangers our first week. Uh, we weren't. We shared our our struggles, our goals for being here, and and then we really we weren't sure where we were headed. But what we realized that many of us um, really had a desire to to start their own business, to to create their own business, and a lot of, a lot of it stemming out of a sense of independence, of not having to work for anyone else, and being uh, their own boss. And that really sparked an idea for us. So we really. Um, as we went through this, the, the empathy, as we started building empathy and understanding why we were together, we actually started to co-create some ground rules. The individuals that we worked with, the community members we were working with, we realized through a lot of our research that they often have rules forced upon them, very much thrust upon them. So if they want to get food or housing or shelter or support, they have to abide by rules that are being dictated by other folks. 
We flipped that model. By co-creating the rules, we actually co-created the ground rules of how we would interact with one another, how we, we, uh, we would interact, and um, what standard we'd hold each other to. We signed, sealed it with our signatures and then really agreed that this is how we would work together. We also quickly realized that our community, and many people in our community, particularly those who are used to asking others for help, were also not just used to being asked for ideas. So when we asked them for it, they simply kind of looked at us and thought, well, you tell me. Because often those living in poverty are used to being told what to do and how to do it in order to get those basic necessities that they need. So we brought in a few basic business design tools. You can see a couple on the screen. Um, and what we were able to do was to change their internal narrative from what am I supposed to do to, well, we're here together to figure it out. And this was actually a critical moment in everyone realizing that they were the masters of this future that we were working on together. It wasn't necessarily something that Marcus and I were driving, but instead supporting. So after a mountain of sticky notes, the team that we were working with in our community decided to make and sell kettles. So the first week, we quickly realized we had no idea how to make candles. So what did we do? We, we watched YouTube videos. Um, and what that made clear, if it wasn't clear already to all of us in the room, was that we were all beginners. And no one had this, we didn't have a structured plan for what the up upcoming months would be, but we would work together and to adapt how we would get there. So the first few weeks were hard. You know what, we realized as we started making candles, simple things like the wicks were floating to the top, they weren't centered. We found that every week the kitchen was a mess, so we'd spend an hour just scrubbing and cleaning the wax off the, the tabletops and off the floor. We also produced very few candles, and it took a lot of time to clean up. And this really you know, was frustrating for the entire team, and we had doubts along the way whether or not we'd actually be able to make candles. But it really, allowed us to take a bit of that fail fast mentality and really focus on continue, continuous improvement. It's part of that mindset as designers that we bring to the table. And it got better. You know, really the first couple of weeks we were lucky to make a handful of candles. You'll see some of the pencils that were holding the wicks in place. Um, the next couple of weeks we got better. We used this, uh, I remember Alan came up with popsicle sticks and clothespins to actually keep the wick centered. Then we started to, to create a couple dozen, but they needed a lot of touch up. And then finally, we actually produced, we were producing over 50 candles a week that required minimal touch up. And now that we had all these candles in place, we actually realized we needed to, to, to share them, to sell them with a community. And the more the, you know, the more we, had participants connect to the community, the more that you know their individual and their group confidence grew. So really through these experiences, one of our team members, Alan, suggested that we actually sell our candles at, uh, actually, sorry, first we actually brought people into, into um, the Young Street Mission. Then Alan really suggested, let's bring, uh, let's go out into the community, into the immediate community in Regent Park and actually selling in markets and festivals. And, and this was really an ambitious goal. We really used the learning, learn by doing model to really help continuously improve how we were telling our stories. Um, and we realized that there was lots of room for improvement and a lot of growth in our communication skills. Simple things, things like don't yell in front of people, how to introduce yourself, um, how to talk to strangers, really, really basic stuff. But we got better week after week. So like Marcus was saying, we started small. Um, around March of 2017, we created an event online and invented our, invited our friends and colleagues to come and listen to our team story about this crazy experience so far. By the summer, we took our participants and we had a booth in a, a fat festival that was nearby and around 20,000 people actually showed up in the course of the weekend. And by September, we had our team members were starting to get invited to actually a lot of social entrepreneurship events. Um, it's interesting because you know often we have a lot of social designers who solve for people in need and people who are homeless, but it was very different to have one of those participants themselves actually speak to the community. And I remember one of our participants 
um, Sharon actually saying, Chenny, I, I can't believe we're on Wall Street. And in case you've never heard of Wall Street before, it's just the Canadian equivalent of, I'm sorry, in, in, in case you've never heard of Bay Street, it's the Canadian equivalent of Wall Street. So although this sounds like, oh yes, you know, clearly makes sense, A, B, C, D, I can tell you that when we first started, we had no idea how we were going to get there. And as a result, we actually couldn't tell our participants what they were going to be able to do. Thankfully, the, um, the uh, community organizers that we were working with allowed us that flexibility um, because we, we told them what our weekly cadence of activities would be. So inspired by Colby and Fry's adult learning framework, we ensured that every single week we created time to do four things. So the first thing we did every week was we would think and learn about new concepts. Second thing we would do is just apply these concepts by experimenting with new tools. And then we would, with a little bit more confidence, use these tools on the business that we were building. And finally, every week we would reflect as a group and think about what we would stop, start, and continue doing. And through the process, we really saw that this was a shift in how um, development and education programs are developed for for this community for these community members. It was really a shift from very prescriptive learning objectives, very well defined learning objectives, to very much participant led. The fact that we actually started a, st a startup, a started a business together, was the fact that several participants were actually interested in running their own business. Um, we, the shift really from being a classroom-based environment with someone standing at the front of the room with a flip chart or with a whiteboard and talking to the community members for an hour or two or three, we really flipped that on its head and it was very much an adaptive, responsive environment. So the environment was initially um, the community center, a kitchen that was familiar. We then brought people into the, uh, into the safe space. And then the learning environment changed to become the immediate community, and then the greater community as we kind of spread out across Toronto. And, and really, the, the interesting thing is that the funding model here is, is very much financially self-sustainable. So unlike very much resource-intensive programs, this one funded itself through the candles we were selling. So when we first started, we were warned um, by the results that they've been seeing in those classroom environments that Marcus was just talking about. You know, um, with low-income communities, it's very common for classes to drop from 20 people to four people in just a couple of weeks. There'd be a security guard on site to prevent violence, and this was really the perceived norm. With our Learn by Doing environment, we actually had complete adherence to the rules, um, largely because I think we generated them together. Um, we had zero incidents of any fights or accidents, and only surprisingly to us as well, 15% of participants dropped out. But for those who showed up, we were really blown away by some of the numbers that we saw. So um, overall, we had a quarter of participants who found full-time or part-time employment, another quarter went back to school, and of the remaining 50%, 12.5% of them found permanent housing. But beyond the stats, we want you to really meet Dwight. You know, two years ago, Dwight was really a pimp, and he's now become a full uh, full time contributing citizen, really inspiring other team members. He's taken on a leadership role in the community. Dwight went from being unemployed to having part time employment as as a line cook to now working a full time job six days a week. And he, more, more importantly, his progression, his confidence, and his leadership has inspired other community members such as Justin. Meet Sharon. Sharon has now got a place of her own in community housing. But more importantly, Sharon's gone back to school for the first time in 40 years, 4-0. I remember a time last summer when we were at the uh, Taste of Regent Park Festival, and my son Max was along and sitting next to Sharon enjoying an ice cream. And Sharon turned to Max and said, Max, are you excited to go back to school? And Max grumbled, no, not really. And Sharon said, I am. I'm going back to school for the first time in such a long time. So it is very much the, the growth in their personal development, but also their confidence has been truly inspiring for us. So you're probably wondering, well, OK, that sounds, that sounds great. But what can I really do with this today? So what we'd like to do is to invite you to think about what kinds of habits and rituals 
you can create for those who are living in need. In other words, how could you, with your friends or your colleagues, create and support responsive learning opportunities for those living in poverty in order for us to all create a more sustainable future? Thanks, guys. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much, you two. That was a great talk. Thanks, Jen. Um, so uh, I just want to call attention again to the Slack channel, which we have. Um, and you guys are welcome to pop in and answer any questions. Um, otherwise, um, thanks so much for the time today and for um, the great walkthrough for this, to this um, this real life design thinking exercise, it was really quite, um, quite instructive, I thought. Thanks, Jen.